China, home to one in five of the planet's population. The superpower the world fears, but few really know. Ken Hom is the godfather of Chinese food. Heaven on earth. He introduced the wok to the West more than 30 years ago. This is the way you should be cooking it. Ching He Huang is leading the next generation of Chinese cooks. I'm just going to chop up the head. With a modern, inventive approach to the cuisine. It's like ducks playing in springtime. Lovely. We're taking a once-in-a-lifetime adventure across China through food. Rabbit head. Shall we try <laughs> To delve into its heart and soul. I can pull it. Food is the best way to explore Chinese culture because we really live to eat. It's an epic trip, 3,000 miles from the mega cities of the East to the forgotten villages of the Wild West. It's like we've been back to the time of Genghis Khan. <laughs> ah! <laughs> she, she's just decapitated it. <laughs> we'll uncover the familiar, the secret, and the surprising. Wow, I've never seen that done before. Cook simple and delicious dishes. That is my Sichuan sausage. And reveal the secrets of China, old and new. Yeah. It's like a journey that I've always dreamt about, but in the China I've dreamt about. We left the heaving megacities of eastern China far behind. Yes! <laughs> to embark on an intrepid journey across China's vast western frontier. Oh my gosh, this, this looks like an ancient medieval city we've it come like to. It's mm. really on the far fringes of China. We're traveling 3,000 miles from the tropical jungle of Yunnan to the deeply divided Muslim city of Kashgar. These regions are home to many of China's 55 ethnic minorities who make up almost 10% of the population. Historically, these minorities were seen as a threat to the realm by Han emperors. We want to discover the fate of their cultures and cuisines in modern China. I think it's beautiful, it's like a ritual. We're spending our first week in Yunnan province in southwest China, on the border with Vietnam, Laos and Burma. Oh, we're here. Yeah, that's beautiful. This is Nanpin village, home to the Dai minority who settled in Yunnan in the 7th century. Is this the village chief? Oh. Tribal chiefs like Bo Wen Jiang have been head of Dai villages for centuries. Once an hereditary post, Today, chiefs are elected by villagers and report to their district communist party government. These families live in homes with few modern conveniences. This is a house? Yeah. And with no electricity, cooking takes place over a simple open fire. Wow, it's a wow. limited kitchen, huh? It's yeah. a... Wow. I like to cook That's here. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him we like to mm -hmm. uh, cook and share uh, with him uh, our love of cooking and mm -hmm. especially uh, the ingredients that you find here. We'll be cooking for the chief later. But first, we're heading out into the local farmland to learn more about the Thai way of life. Look what I like, Lena, is what, how they take the creek, uh, how they irrigate the fields. Yeah. I like that very much. Yeah. yeah. The Dai people were one of the first cultivators of rice in China. Today, like 128 million of China's rural poor, the villagers of Nanpin live on less than a pound a day. To survive, they must utilize everything in their environment. These local foresters are proving just how resourceful they must be. How do they know how mm -hmm. to 
you know, mm. a harvest bamboo, because it is a skill, because their knife skills are incredible. This is the strongest steel. Yeah. And it's flexible, mm. too. Yeah. And it can be reused again yeah, and again. Yeah, absolutely. Yunnan has 250 types of bamboo, and the dive villagers have found ingenious uses for it, from building houses, bridges, and farm tools to making food and medicine. Now they are preparing uh, for lunch. For these foresters who spend long hours working up the mountains, one bamboo tree will provide them with all the kitchen utensils they need to make lunch on the go. When the food is uh, prepared, they put the food in it. It's a big bowl. Look at this, they've made these as well. I like this, I want one of these. Yeah. Now they are making <laughs> chopsticks. Oh, they're making oh, chopsticks. Brilliant. Bamboo they're making chopsticks. chopsticks. It's amazing. Chopsticks. Can they make us a bamboo yeah. steamer to take home as well? <laughs> yeah. 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 Everything here is sustainable, natural. The men are making two dishes for lunch using the bamboo stalks. Oh, they... So first the aromatics. Oh, okay, the aromatics. Wow. Yum. No cook. That looks great. First is a fragrant chicken stew with chili, ginger and Vietnamese mint. The ingredients are stuffed inside the bamboo stalk. Water is added. Then rolled up banana leaves are used to seal the contents to keep in the moisture. This shows what Chinese civilization and food is all about. It's ingenious. Wow. It's ingenious. Because it's using everything from your environment in a nice way. The second dish is made of glutinous rice and peanuts, which are packed inside a smaller bamboo stalk. My it's grandmother not too always much. said, don't uh, waste yeah. rice, because you know, each grain of rice is like a bead of sweat, yes. because it takes such hard work and backbreaking to collect each grain. Mm -hmm. Now he said you can cook it. Okay. Yeah. Both bamboo stalks are put on the open fire to cook for about half an hour. It's certainly a new thing for me. I, I've never seen anything like this. And I think it's fantastic. So he's stirring. I think uh, this ritual shows that China is still very agrarian. Almost half the population has moved to the urban areas. But still, it has a very rich agricultural heritage. Mm. Mm. And I think this type of ritual expresses that. Chicken, yes. It's done. Oh, it's finished. Yeah, let's just finish. That looks good. How wonderful. There goes the head. The head. Oh, now he's going to crack it open. He's cracking it open. Oh, that looks good. Wow. Because of all the herbs. It's spicy too. That is wonderful. That is really wonderful. There is that bamboo yeah. fragrance and that Which is very really unusual. beautiful, delicate sweetness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful. They have their tradition and it's nice that they maintain it. Mm. Who needs mm. the hand? The eldest here. Mm. No, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> mm. There's some Chinese tradition I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> After lunch, we head back to the village to prepare dinner for our host, the chief. <laughs> Whilst Ching and the women go river fishing for some of tonight's ingredients. Huh? Oh! Okay. I start on the chicken. Okay. okay. So you, you must cut, like here. Yep, just one. And you let it bleed. And the blood is not wasted because uh, you put it in salt and you can make a sort of blood pudding with it. It goes in soup or is stir-fried. You can't feel the heart beating anymore. And that's it. I did that when I taught uh, professional chefs how to cook, and half of the class uh, almost fainted, and the other half of the class went to complain to the dean. And the dean said to me, Ken, 
yeah. please don't ever do that again. <laughs> but if you want to really learn uh, about food, I think it, you have to take the good and the bad. You just can't go to the supermarket and say, you, you eat chicken, you have to know how it's killed. And if you don't, I mean, if you don't like it, it bothers you, then don't eat it. Simple as that. The chief and I are going to cook a dish, each with this chicken, to feed 10 people. This might look small compared to what you find in Britain, where we eat, on average, three times more chicken per person than the Chinese. But in a country where there are over one billion mouths to feed, that kind of consumption is unsustainable. Meat is to garnish the veggies. And in the West, veggies are a second thought. I mean, you usually have a big piece of meat, and then you have all these vegetables that are a second thought. And uh, as we know, that's not good for your health. To me, that's really the lessons I think the, the West can learn from Chinese dietary practices. I'm cooking a chicken stir-fry, which, in true resourceful Thai style, is using ingredients sourced within 50 yards of where I'm standing. Even the sauce for the marinade is homemade. I asked the chief, can I have some rice wine? And this is a homemade brew that he makes. Whew, God, if I taste this, I won't be able to cook. <laughs> mm. That's, <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. I think I better give it to the chicken. <laughs> I'm leaving the chicken to marinate for half an hour in light soy sauce and the chief's home brewed rice wine. <laughs> the Dai ladies do all the fishing for their village. There are more than 600 rivers and lakes in Yunnan with millions of people depending on them for food and water. I've never seen this unique way of fishing. They're just upturning rocks and, you know, getting really in there. So it's quite, it's a very clever technique because you kind of sandwich the net between your feet and then you use your hands to bring the, the vegetation and the seabed into the, into the net. Oh! She's got two big ones. It's just a river fish. Pang <gasps> hai, pang xie, crab. Living below China's official poverty line, the Dai women can't afford to overlook any potential source of protein in the river. Ah, she said that you can eat this. Looks like some weird river centipede thing. I was like, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> She's just decapitated it. <laughs> she can eat that. She said it's delicious. They really have a respect for the environment. You know, they said they don't fish every day, um, which means they give the river a chance to uh, recover and the fish to, you know, thrive. For the time being, the women are safe to fish in these waters. But this might not be the case for much longer. Because in recent years, many of Yunnan's waterways have become contaminated with pollution from its cities, less than 40 miles away. Back at May's house, we're going to prepare our river catch. And a lot of the fish is still alive. Did you see that? Just with one knife cut, she guts it and gets rid of the intestines and the belly in one fell knife swoop, even though the fish is so small. Oh, oh, oh. She just rips the head off and the tail off that sort of centipede. I came to China to expand my knowledge of Chinese cooking. Learning how to gut a centipede is certainly doing that. Mm. <laughs> women know how to cook. And also let the men wash the dishes. I understood that bit. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I don't understand. Men don't understand. They only know how to eat. <laughs> so I've got here a small river fish, and then I've got just local garlic, wild garlic, some ginger, uh, some small 
chilies. This is the local chilies. And then there's the uh, Vietnamese mint. And then they've got here some uh, coriander as well. And then some spring onion. I'm going to make a classic dye dish of fish cooked in banana leaves. Let's just finally chop it. My grandmother would always peel it. And the Chinese believe that when you peel ginger, it becomes more heat, heat giving property, more yang more fiery. If you keep the ginger skin on, then it makes the dish more yin, it's more cooling. First, I'm putting chopped ginger, garlic and chilli onto a banana leaf, closely scrutinised by my sous chef, who's keen to offer tips. She said, she said, chop it, actually, chop all the herbs together, so it's really fine. I would have just thrown it all together, but this is the way they're used to doing. Okay, so we put this all on the leaf like that. Wrapping the food in a banana leaf seals in moisture and flavour, much like foil or oven-proof paper. And then you, you just tie it. Being here with May and her family takes me back to my childhood, when I was under the supervision of two other formidable family cooks, my grandmother and mother. So she's just securing the package within some bamboo. I'm planning to steam the fish, but my sous chef has other ideas. Oh, then that's how they would normally cook it. She said it's tastier like this than steaming it. She said it's better too. She said if you, if you steam it, it doesn't taste very good. While it cooks for 20 minutes, May offers me an appetizer. This is a baby didu. This is the centipede. The water centipedes she caught at the river have been boiled in a broth of chilies, ginger, and herbs. She said, Don't be afraid, just eat it. It's like texture, like prawns. It's like river prawn texture, river shrimp. It's not bad. It's not bad, actually. At the chief's house, he's doing his bit to prove that not all men are useless in the kitchen. He's making chicken soup with ginger and chili. This dish is relatively simple. He's very smart not to do anything complicated. <laughs> but I think people don't realize, you know, when you cook it at home, you should keep it really nice and simple. I'm using chili and garlic to make one of my favorite dishes, chicken stir-fry with fresh herbs. I'm just going to put my chicken in. Okay. And adding the marinade in there. I am going to add all my lovely herbs here. This is what I love about Chinese food. All you need is a wok, a flame, and fresh ingredients to make a simple and delicious supper. To go with the chicken, I'm making a classic Yunnan dish, pineapple rice. Ginger, a little bit of salt. I'm going to do our rice. The key ingredient in this dish is pre-cooked cold rice, ideally a day old, stir-fried in very hot oil. To break up the clumps, give the rice a good stir. Then add the pineapple and fresh mint. <laughs> the wood fire gives it a lovely smoky flavor. With fresh local ingredients, this is traditional village cooking at its best. In Thailand, we say hom. Oh, what's me hom? Uh, fragrant. Something smells good, we say hom. Oh. Hom, good. Fragrant. Yeah, hom. We are ready. Just have to wait for Ching and the rest of the women for the fish. Yeah, everyone is hungry. So this is the uh, the banana leaf that we yes. Fish. Oh, beautiful. Wow. <laughs> she said it's a very good. This is a soup this uh, one? the chief made. Oh, delicious. Yeah, that, this soup. is uh, pineapple mm. rice. Didu. You know what, what you just it? ate? No. It's a centipede. Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting flavor. Oh, yeah, it's quite yeah. sweet. Yes, but uh, I wouldn't order it every day. <laughs> Oh, this rice is delicious. Mmm. 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 How so? How so? So inspired by the use of the local ingredients. You know, 
like fishing for your own fish. You can't get fresher than right. that. Isn't that just wonderful? They're really close to the earth. Nature, yeah. Yes. Mm. It's our second day in Yunnan province, and we're enjoying a traditional breakfast at the guest house. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Look at her outfit, so beautiful. This looks like wow. some sort of vegetable. It's fiddlehead fern. And I love it, chilies, like in Thailand. Oh, look, garlic chilies. This is the most unusual breakfast, breakfast. I've had in China so mm. far. This is supposed to be the birthplace of tea in the whole of China, so I'm excited to try uh, the poor tea because that's one of my favorite teas. It's awfully good for you. It's very uh, cleansing and it helps to lower cholesterol and helps prevent heart disease, all these good things. Pua tea, named after a town in Yunnan, came to prominence when it was drunk by emperors during the Tang Dynasty 1300 years ago. Today, it's a global export industry worth millions of pounds. Unlike most teas, which can lose their freshness soon after production, Pua tea is fermented, which improves the taste, texture and aroma. The most sought-after Pua teas can take 30 years to mature, and one cup of leaves can reach up to 1,000 pounds. After a two-hour journey, I arrive at the tiny village of Zhanglang home to the Bulang minority, who have been growing, tending and harvesting tea for thousands of years. Oh, look, there's some tea being dried in the sun. It's a very underdeveloped part of Yunnan. Wow, we're really high up and this is a gorgeous little village. Danglang is home to 45 families, 80% of whom make a living from selling Pua tea leaves to processing factories. Xiao Li and Xiao Lu are two young tea picker friends. This is Tai Tai Ta. They started tea picking when they were 11 and 12. They're very young. They went to primary school. There's a school in the village, um, but they left school about 10. So, and they've been tea picking ever since. We head outside to the plantation so the girls can show me the ropes. China's emerging free market economy and state promotion of tea over the last 10 years resulted in an export boom. Many villagers in Yunnan converted their subsistence land into tea terraces. This is just... The size of it, it's huge. I've never seen experienced a tea plantation this big. But an investor buying frenzy led to lots of fake poor teas flooding the market. And in 2008, the bubble burst and thousands of tea producers went out of business. They're like, they're super fast. It's like a blink and then they've gone through a whole bush. But with their organic production methods and indigenous skills passed down through the generations, the Bulang were able to brand the authenticity of their Pua tea and ride out the collapse. So this is the best part. This is the part that they pick off the leaves of the tea. So first the tender you know, shoot that's coming out and the top two leaves, that's the most prized bit. And it's because it has more tea fragrance as opposed to sort of the older leaves. And I've never cooked with these poor green tea leaves before, so I'm really excited. It's very tender. Slightly bitter, but it's good for you. Because actually, with tea, in traditional Chinese medicine, they say that you must have tea in your diet because it's that bitterness that we lack. You can get salt, sweet, sour, fiery, pungent flavours from many different vegetables and fruit. But you can't get bitterness, that flavour profile, but you can get it from tea. After a couple of hours, we're heading back to prepare dinner with the leaves we've picked. I think the grandmother is the culinary expert. She's looking at me with her out of the corner of her eye. <laughs> Even though I've been cooking for years, it's always a little nerve-wracking entering another woman's kitchen. 
<laughs> 小一点，大一点。No, she was saying that normally they cut the chicken into smaller pieces, but I haven't cut it small enough. <laughs> For dinner, I'm making chicken infused with pua tea leaves. First, I'm adding freshly picked leaves and chicken to the hot oil in the wok. I love it. It's really woody and smoky from the wood fire underneath. After stir frying for about four minutes, I add a cup of pua tea made from sun dried leaves. Okay, so I'm just going to pour the tea in together with some of those leaves. Now I'm going to just slowly let the chicken infuse with the flavours of the tea. Yeah, there's a quick taste of the seasoning. You know, that the infusion, that soup base has now become really sort of bittersweet, you know, from the chicken. It's really delicious, actually. I quite like the idea of putting some of these pea aubergine in, just a handful. What I might do is just add another element of sweetness, and that is from the leaves of the local uh, pumpkin plant here. <coughs> so I'm just going to toss that with the pumpkin leaves in this tea chicken broth. And then, uh, yeah, we're good to eat. If you want to try this recipe at home, you can use green tea leaves instead of pua and substitute the pea aubergines with diced purple aubergine. Now it just remains to be seen what Grandma makes of my efforts. She said She said yeah the flavor is good, not bad. <laughs> I'm on my way to Jing Hong, Yunnan's fastest growing city. It's just 40 miles north of the tiny mountain village of Zhang Lang, but it feels like a world away. I actually didn't expect this, like a mass construction site. And things are being excavated like crazy. The construction is at a phonetic pace. I came to China expecting it to have changed since my last big trip 23 years ago. But this city is beyond what I imagined, brash, gaudy and jam-packed with tourists. Sort of a Chinese Disneyland, the whole place, Las Vegas. So this place will really take off. Cultural tourism has been an integral part of China's modernization strategy for 20 years. Here in Jinghong, there are 13 different ethnic minorities, and their colorful festivals and foods draw Chinese visitors from all over the country. As the city adapts to the demands of tourism, I want to know if these minorities have retained their distinct cultural identities. I'm in a suburb of Jinghong, where many Thai families have set up small cottage industries producing traditional Yunnan food for the tourist trade, including one of my absolute favorites. It's something I grew up with. My mom was a great fan of it. She used to send me out getting fresh rice noodles stir-fried and it was a special treat. Is this it? Oh, it's huge. Wow. Hello, Mr. Hi, hey, how, are how are you? How are you? This is Mr. Ai. Hi, Mr. Ai. Mr. Ai and his wife used to be farmers. Now they run a successful business supplying noodles to some of the busiest tourist restaurants in the city. And it's all done from their garage. This is made from uh, rice flour? Yeah. Right. Yes, it is. They soak the rice, rice first, and yeah. then they grind it, right. and then move it to the okay. big pot. After the rice is ground into flour, it's combined with water to make dough. The exact quantities are closely guarded family secret. Finally, the dough is passed through a noodle extruder. It's almost an art, the way she's handling it. See, none of it breaks. She knows exactly what point to cut it. I love it, it's like putting out your laundry. <laughs> it all has to do with the, the weight. And she, she takes it and she feels the weight of it. It's too heavy on one side. And uh, I guess it's an art. She's been doing it for a while. She's amazing. <laughs> Mrs. I invites me to have a go. We will do it. It's not as even as hers. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> what a mess. No prizes for guessing which one is mine. Rice noodles have been established fair in Yunnan for centuries. They're gluten-free with a silky texture that absorbs flavors more efficiently than the less spongy wheat noodles, which makes them perfect for soups and stir-fries. <laughs> I'd like to invite you oh. to have my noodles. I would be so happy <laughs> to try them. Okay. It's great to see Dai migrants from the countryside making a wow. successful living in the city, producing traditional food for the burgeoning tourist industry. The rice noodles apparently has been an old family recipe. They were selling it out of their farm before, and they decide to be more entrepreneurial, which is what has happened in China. You have these very small families that are starting businesses like this. This is really the base of capitalism. And who knows, maybe in the next 30 years, there'll be a gigantic corporation <laughs> based on this family recipe. If you're curious. After breakfast, Mr. Ai is keen to show me around his house. Oh, nice living room, mm. a nice sofa. Oh, that's their son? Oh, oh. that's your son. Oh. He's very cute. How many bedrooms? Uh, four. four. Four bedrooms. Wow, it's very... Uh, very big house. <coughs> his, uh, his house is uh, smaller than others. Oh, really? Their neighbors. <laughs> much bigger. Neighbor is much bigger. <laughs> yeah. Business is clearly booming for Mr. Ai, and things can only get better with 1.5 billion pounds earmarked for tourism development in Jinghong. There's wow. an airport over there. <laughs> wow. That's the airport? Yeah. Oh. It's under construction now. So many tourists will come and they need more airport to meet the demand. I see. This tour city might have a Disneyland feel to it. But from what I've seen today, the minorities here are really embracing the opportunities it offers. And it's not at the expense of their cultural and culinary traditions. They have ambitions. They thought that their culture and everything that went with it, like their cuisine, would be wiped out. And instead, um, it's thriving like crazy. Nowhere is this more evident than in the local market. This is exciting. <laughs> it's things I've never seen before. These uh, uh, local ladies are so elegant with their gloves and... <laughs> this excites me. Wow, this is beautiful. It's our final night in Yunnan. Ching is about to join me in Jinghong, so I'm picking up some local ingredients for dinner. Now, this is something I really wanted to try here, especially in Yunnan, because Yunnan is famous for bamboo. So several bamboo shoots would be nice. We have tried these noodles before, and I want to try one of my favorite. These are rice noodles as well, and it's actually been partially cooked by steaming, and it's again made with rice flour and water. Oh my God, that does look like a looks like Las Vegas. Bright lights. <laughs> and then look, we've got Thailand over there. Yeah, Since are. rice noodles are a speciality of Yunnan, I'm using them to make one of my favorite dishes, stir-fried rice noodles with broad beans and bamboo shoots. It's really important when you cook rice noodles is get the flavor of the wok, right? I love that smoky doorway. I'm going to add a this tiny bit so of this great. lovely chili oil, the garlic. Wow, that is fantastic. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take it out for a second and I'm going to stir fry the rest of the vegetables. So I love it. You're like a perfectionist yes. cook like my grandmother. She'd always cook <laughs> each ingredient and perfectly and then add, bring them back into the wok to warm right. through and then add the seasoning, like, you know, the soy sauce Good or the vinegar or something. is in steps. What I mean by that is you cook one thing and then you take it out. I'm putting in the bamboo shoots and the uh, broad beans, adding a little bit of rice wine to that. 
lovely soy sauce. And we just let that cook over uh, quite a high temperature until it's sort of cooked and wilted. Oh, that looks good. Oyster mm -hmm. sauce. Yum. This is really... I love oyster sauce. Am I allowed to try some? Mmm. Mm. Oh, that's so good. That is mm. delicious. Mm. This dish is really Yunnan for me, especially with this rice noodle, which is very unusual, soft and... Mm. It's really delicious. Chin, I don't know about you, but even with all this incredible change in this place, mm. I don't think the food will change, simply because of um, its long tradition. They're so proud of their produce. And for me, the way when I saw the tea farmers from their farm and, you know, just if that tradition has been going thousands of years, mm. I know for sure tea and food go hand in hand. Their food will absolutely be preserved. So good. To Cheers, Yunnan Ken. And it's food and it's people. And to poor tea and the yes, beer. Yes, absolutely. And Disneyland. <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> We're on the second stage of our epic journey across China's vast western frontier, where few travelers dare to venture. After traveling more than 3,000 miles northwest, we arrive in Gashgar, in Shenzhen province, which lies on the borders with Afghanistan and Pakistan. Kashgar is home to a veiled minority, whose culture is at odds with the modernizing zeal of the ruling Han Chinese. Gosh, this, this looks like an ancient medieval city we've it come to. Like it's really on the far fringes of China. This city was once a major center on the Silk Road, the 7,000-mile trade route that connected China's Yellow River Valley with India and the Mediterranean. Today, Kashgar is a deeply divided city. In the old town, the Uyghurs, Turkic Muslim people from Central Asia, strive to preserve their ancient culture and religious practices. While in the new city, the recent influx of Han Chinese, who make up 92% of China's population, build their skyscrapers with the riches of the region's oil and gas. This is where the Far East meets the Middle East. I don't feel like I'm in China. I feel like I'm Central Asia, but it's not China. It's where there have been violent protests from disenfranchised Uyghurs against the Han Chinese. And where tradition and modernity are in open conflict. We've come to the market to find out if Uyghur culinary and religious customs are surviving in this ethnically divided city. This is certainly the most exotic place we've been to uh, in China. We're met by our guide, Mohammed. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. Nice How to meet you? you. I am Mohammed. Nice oh, to meet you. Welcome you. to Kashgar. Nice to meet you, Mohammed. Nice to meet you. You guys just arrived? Yes. Yes, yes. we did. Oh, yeah. Come on, I show you around. Thank okay. you. Thanks. It's a pleasure. A thousand years ago, this market would have been overrun with caravans bringing goods in and out of China on the Northern Silk Road. Today, with over 5,000 stalls, it's jam-packed with traders hot off the Karakoram Highway from Pakistan. Raisins. These are apricot seeds. Apricot seeds. Yeah. So that's sunflower seeds. Mm. People wow. just mix a little bit of everything, like put it into their pocket. Mm. Delicious, mm. yeah. Mm. Very good. Mm. Healthy cream. You know, apricot seed is very good for men. Yeah. Really? Oh. <laughs> I won't ask you why. You eat this, you don't need Viagra. <laughs> oh, very good. Wandering through the market is striking to see one food you'd be hard pressed to find anywhere else in China. Wow, this, uh -huh. this wow. is what I want to oh, say. Delicious. Yeah, can we buy one? Yes. Here, naan bread is sold on virtually every street corner. Mm. Oh, oh, yes, with I sesame love. seeds with onion? Salt? Yeah, they just put those on top. 2,000 years ago, 
the nomadic cattle herders traveling through this region relied on this bread to sustain them in the desert. Today, Uyghurs consider it to be sacred. Bread means life. So you cannot throw bread away? Never. You like Never. throwing away your life? I, if even it's too old, I rather take it to somebody Mm. Just feed the sheep, you know, with okay. this. Mm -hmm. I never throw it into the rubbish. Naan bread is traditionally baked in large outdoor tandoor ovens. The hot clay walls of the oven bake the bread crispy on the bottom, but leave it soft in the center. But the skill lies in getting it to stick onto the oven oh. wall. Okay. Oh, God. Okay, God. <laughs> <laughs> Good, 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 push it. Oh, no. oh my God, it's oh falling no. down. Oh, shake. Oh, my, oh, no. oh, oh my God, shake. Oh, oh no. Oh, Where is it? No, my bread. Uh, oh, God. Oh, God. God, I dread to do this now. Okay, just slap it on, okay. basically, Ken. Okay. Oh. Is it? Uh, oh. Why? Uh. It's not exactly like his. Wow, there's mine. It's a new take on a calzone. <laughs> <laughs> Poor chick. Hey, this could be a new innovation here, this style of bread. Huh? It's a new way of eating. In 2009, the Chinese government began a 300 million pound clear up of Gashgar demolishing mosques, markets, and century-old houses in the Uyghur-dominated Old City. How many people still live around here? About 200,000. More than oh. half of the population of Sakashigar City see. are living in the Old City. Right. It's really packed up. Is it because mm. it's convenient? And... Because they've been living in this town for many, many generations, mm. about 1,000 years. And, you know, they grow up here. They like their home. You know, mm. most of the houses are inherited mm. from their, you know, parents or mm. grandparents. Mm. Everybody knows right. each other in the neighborhood. Right. Many Uyghurs are trying hard to resist assimilation with the Han Chinese. And one way they're doing it is through food. One thing us Cantonese don't eat much of is lamb. But in Kashgar, it's both a ceremonial and an everyday meat. And every Kashgari knows there's only one place to buy it. Thousands of people swarm into Kashgar every Sunday for the livestock market. It's a disorientating cacophony of animals, car horns, and bartering traders. Today is particularly busy because Nowruz is coming up, an ancient Persian festival celebrated by the Uyghurs, which marks the coming of spring. And lamb is as essential to that as turkey is to a British Christmas. With the market so busy, we're relieved to have Muhammad's friend Wahab to show us around. This animal market has a history of more than 2,000 years. Wow. It's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, I feel like we've stepped back in olden time. It's like we've been <laughs> back to the time of Genghis Khan. <laughs> yeah. We're meeting the number one roast lamb chef in Kashgar. He's got an order for a New Year celebration and is here to find the best sheep. Hello. Uh, hello. This is uh, one yeah. of the best quality sheep. The three first, years old. Two years old. Three three years old. Three you can years tell old. by the teeth. Yes. I mean, why would they buy a three year old? Is that different? Yes, if it's younger, yeah. it's more, better quality. And also, the, the taste of the sheep is more delicious. If the sheep's ear is bigger, yeah. it's much better. Oh, really? Yes. Oh. For taste? Yeah. For taste and for, oh, for breeding. For breeding. For breeding yes. We're keen to know how the chef is going to prepare and roast the lamb, so he invites us to his kitchen to observe an age-old tradition. Hello. This, this is the sheep? Yes, this is the sheep. going to slaughter? He's going to slaughter it here. It must be done by a halal way. If it's not, it's not possible to eat. Before he slaughter, he must read a Quran. 
just uh, and he's reading Quran and slaughtering. 39-year-old Asmajan has been in the business for 15 years, learning his skill from his father. It's very quick. It's fast, huh? After the sheep is slaughtered, air is pumped into the skin to make it easier for the chef to remove it. He's a real expert. He is a real expert, huh? Mm. Muslim people, we don't eat the blood. Mm. You don't eat the blood. That's why you don't save it. That's why you, don't you don't save, save it. it, yeah. You don't save it. Because we keep the blood, chicken's blood, pig's blood, yes. and we make a little like rice cakes and we oh, grill yes. it. Sausage. You don't. It's actually quite good, no? No. Yeah. It's reassuring to see that a centuries old Islamic culinary tradition is still going strong. It's like an eggy, starchy yeah. wash. wash. And also when it's uh, roasted, it's not burned. Oh, yeah. this protects it from yes. mm. burning. Burning, yes. It's not what I expected no. to look like. No. No, I show that the dumb black, that the dumb that's so much that's a big amount of data. You know, chong the dumb, 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 the Grandfather. And grandfather's father. Yes. Jesus. Oh, so many generations. Many generations. Yes, and his two uncles. Good, good, maybe she. He's the number five. Oh. Yes. Like, uh, I start with Allah helps me with a successful ending. Oh, wow. I think it's beautiful. It's like a ritual. No? Yes, yes, like that. Yes. <laughs> the chef has asked me to make a dish to complement the lamb for the New Year's feast. God, I've cooked a lot of places in my time, but this is this beats it. <laughs> I want to use local ingredients, but with my Chinese style of cooking. There's the chef's daughters over there. <laughs> they look like him. <laughs> I'm making my version of a very famous Uyghur dish called polo. This is rice pilaf, flavored with onion, fine strips of carrots, dry fruit, and nuts. I have a little bit of water just boiling here, which I'll flavor with some saffron that I got at the market. The saffron should go into hot water. This helps to release the aroma that will infuse the dish. I am also adding a pinch of salt and a teaspoon of cumin. It'll be flavorful. Cumin isn't a spice we use much in Chinese cooking because it's got such a strong flavor, but it's very popular in Middle Eastern dishes. When the oil is hot in the wok, add two chopped onions and stir fry for about a minute. Then add the carrots, salt and pepper, and stir-fry for another couple of minutes. Uh, I'm just putting in some celery. I'm trying to use everything that's in their resources. That's local, yeah. I'm going to cover that because that will maximize the temperature. This should be left to simmer for about eight minutes. Uh, I have here some lovely pistachio, apricot seeds, and some raisins. Well, we're really here at the crossroad of uh, east and west. And this is very Middle Eastern, using all these nuts. Yeah. Uh, Next, the rice goes in. Now this rice is a little bit like short grain. Just uh, warm it up. What I'll add is my liquid of, of water and saffron, a little bit of salt and spices. Finally, add the pistachio nuts, apricot kernels, raisins, and chopped celery leaves. It's different, good different. The taste is good and it looks pretty, it's colorful. Okay, thank you, Shoki. Okay. <laughs> Onions are really sweet. Rice is cooked through and tender. The raisins in there really adds a sweetness, yeah, and the apricot kernels have good crunch, good texture. Oh. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> wow. Oh. <laughs> that's, cute. that's great. Yeah. 
This, it looks so ceremonial. Mm. After a few embellishments, the lamb is ready to go to the New Year's feast. Nowruz is the most important date on the Uyghur calendar. So it's an honor to be able to deliver the lamb and my rice polo to a family celebration. So Ken, we go to the men, men's party and Chen, you go to the ladies' party here. Okay, so it's separate. <laughs> it's separate. Separate. Okay. That's nice, isn't it? But that's their culture, so something I'm not used to. So is this a tradition that men and women eat separately? Yes, that's all tradition. Is. is that every day or for no, occasion? No, once a year. Once a year? Once a year. Yes. Other times they eat together? They eat together, yes. Oh, OK. So how will the women have the lamb? No, they bring the, some big plate. We we'll oh. just take it to the okay. ladies' party. Yeah. One, two, one. All the food today was made by all the women, by all um, her mum and law's uh, family and sisters. They don't question, you know, that's the way they've lived for many, many years. I'd like to wish them all a very prosperous New Year. <laughs> We've left the New Year celebration behind to go to Muhammad's house where we've been invited to his family's Norris festivities. Muhammad, this is it? Yes, we are right. Once again, we're entering the domain of a formidable group of women. This is my mother. Hello. This is my wife. Hello. This is my Hi. uncle's Hello. wife. Hello. This is my younger Hello. sister. It's going to be a real privilege to cook with these women, particularly as men are usually banned from their kitchen. Oh, Muhammad, your wife is really quick, really good at making the noodles, huh? Everything is prepared by hand. It tastes better. I agree. I agree. The Uyghurs, like Italians, are pasta specialists and claim to make 72 different varieties. Today, the ladies are making two family favorites. So the thickness should be all the same. Muhammad's wife is showing me how to make lachman, the famous hand-pulled noodles of this region. Oh, 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 okay. I said, wow, this is quite a thick noodle. And she said, no, 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 it goes to another stage. We kind of pull it to make it thinner. It's a two-stage process. First, we roll the dough, made of flour and water, into long sausages. Then we coil them around the circular base of an oiled tin and leave them to rest for half an hour. Oh, the dough is ready now. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mohammed's mother is making chakora, which is a dumpling soup. So this is for the dumpling. How? Long she's been making these dumplings. Mr. Chuchu, you're it what can I can't you all day? It's in a about 50 years. I could just tell by the way she moves, she's yes. she's very skilled. First, she rolls out the dough, which is made from egg whites rather than yolks, so that she can stretch it out more. Instead of having a very big thing to roll, she rolls it like I'm one thing. This is how. Italians also do uh, pasta. I paid my way through university by giving lessons in how to make Italian pasta. Side by side. Wow. Now I feel like the student. <laughs> so clever. This is worth the trip out here. Yeah. <laughs> to see this. Absolutely. Once Mohammed's mother has cut the dough into small squares, we roll them into parcels, which are then stuffed with alfalfa sprouts. Oh, wow, that's like tortellini. Tortellini. That's veg that's a fish for tortellini. <coughs> you take a little bit. And then, and then like just... Fold them to itself, like that. Like that? As the honorary male cook, 
I want to know if I pass the test with the women of the house. <laughs> Kenny's okay though. Oh, I think she's telling oh, him off. Yeah. I think she's saying, oh, she's a, you should come she in should the be kitchen more often. often. <laughs> she yeah. says she's really impressed. She said, our oh, man should come to the kitchen yeah. too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it needed no translation. <laughs> it needed no translation. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> the dumplings need to boil for five minutes until they become translucent. Meanwhile, I head outside to see how Mohammed's auntie is getting on with the rest of the meal. Uh, this is just the sauce just, for the noodles, right? Yeah. There's no meat in this one. There are meat in oh, it. Oh, there is meat. Yeah, okay. lamb in it. Lamb, okay. Yeah. Lamb everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm helping Mohammed's aunt finish the Lachman noodles. The first step is to pull each length of the noodle onto an oiled board. Just pull. She's kind of working the dough, spinning it. Then she winds the noodles around her hands. And now for the most difficult part, stretching them out. But it looks like she's playing cat's cradle. Wow. Wow. Kali Hale. Then they go into a wok of boiling water for three minutes. Uh, she took it like that. <laughs> this is a long piece of noodle. Bang it. Pull it. Bang it. Slap it against the board. That's it. Ta da! It's the end of our time in Kashgar and our exploration of China's ethnic minority cuisines. Okay. okay, please. Okay. Thank you. Does it start with a noodle? Okay. Yeah. Wow, this is the one you pulled? Mm. This, I really, really am in love with the noodles. Yes. It really is springy mm. and delicious, and it's really satisfying making your own noodles. Mm -hmm. China is so diverse, so many different people, different ideas, different religions, different cultures the Dai minority, the Bulang minority, through food, that's, you know, that's their identity. Then now we're the Uyghurs. That's their culture just right on the plate, right there, says it all. It's magnificent. Mohammed, to you mm. and your whole family, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I've learned and discovered by coming to Kashgar and Gunan was I think it deepened my understanding about China. Even though they're within the Chinese nation, they haven't lost their local traditions, which I think is very important. Next time, we journey to Guangdong province. This is where my culinary soul is. <laughs> to explore the many faces of Cantonese cuisine. Oh my God, alligators. And culture in the city where my parents met. They are going to sing my mother's favorite aria. Very touched. Before we complete our journey across China with an emotional pilgrimage to our ancestral homes. My food memory started here. I think I have come full circle. We're in one of the world's most remote places, braving minus 30 degrees as we head for wild China next.